Um, hi, Hi, Sammy. Sammy. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to talk to you about this film because I, um, I also first, not, I think not at Sundance, saw it at BAM Cinema Fest um, and was totally floored. I think it, it reflected some kinds of the like, cinephile, like young cinephile and artist experience that I hadn't quite seen on screen before. And I think I told you, I, um, the next time I went to see it, I uh, insisted that my best friend from high school oh, right, come with yeah. me. And I think it's a, it inspires people to do it. Like it really makes you immediately think of right. the people who spark, sparked your creativity when you were young. Yeah, cool. How's it been reuniting with all the people, first for the film and now again as it's in theaters? Um, oh yeah, so it's, it's also playing at the Metrograph, not just Netflix, um, if you're in New York, go see it on the big screen if you can. Um, and, um, and the music hall in LA, I think. The music hall in LA. Tell your yeah. LA friends who want to see this yeah. in the theater. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And otherwise, uh, it'll be available on Netflix for mm. a long time to come. <laughs> yeah, a long time to come. Um, yeah, so how was it like to reunite with... Okay, so I should talk a little bit about... In case nobody's seen the film, nobody knows what I'm talking about. How many people have seen the film, out of curiosity? Oh, wow. Well, okay, okay, so some people... These, this yeah. is still going to just pique your interest. Okay, so it's it's a it's a film about me making a film. Um, oh, that's really scary that you're rec recording this. Um, uh, it's 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 a you know many many years ago in 1992 in Singapore um, when nobody was making these mo nobody was making movies. Me and my my teenage friends. I was a teenager then growing up in Singapore. We made a um, a road movie called Shirkers in which I played the lead character who was kind of a teenage assassin, kind of and. Um, and I wrote the movie and, and played the lead. And with my friends, we shot this thing with an American man in his 40s. It's not a spoiler to say this, that he kind of, um, he ran away with all the footage once we finished shooting the film. And it was a heartbreaking experience for all of us. And, you know, this film is about me kind of recovering the footage, recovering the friendships and recovering actually my youth, I guess, um, that had been lost in the process in the last 25 years. Um, it actually sounds more interesting the way I'm, than, than what I'm saying, because it's, it's kind of a dull way of putting it. Um, but yeah, so that's basically it. And so I guess what you're saying is that that process kind of fractured my friendships with my friends who were involved in this film. And making this version of sure because had forced me to kind of get in touch with them again. Um, and so what was that like? Mm -hmm. and, and what was that like was, Making this film, because I'm such a lousy friend, I am somebody who doesn't really call and doesn't really, you know, write. And especially because the three of us were, were so bound by this um, traumatic experience that we didn't have to talk about it very much. We just were always kind of linked by this memory of this experience. Um, and, um, you know, we, we 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 don't have to talk for 20 years and, and it would just seem like yesterday so so this film when we showed this film at Sundance um in January it was the first time Jasmine that's Jasmine Sophie and me the three of us had been in the same room um you know in 20 years I think that was so 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 but getting in, back in touch with them when I recovered the film the, the footage that was stolen um was difficult because it's, you know, you understand once you've seen the film that they are two very different personalities. Um, Jasmine's still like super angry about everything. Sophie's extremely sad about everything. She's always, you know, just talking about it just makes her cry. Mm -hmm. She's the nicest person in the world, the most sensible, most, you know, articulate, and Jasmine's not the most reasonable person in the world. Um, but how about one you? Of most, one of the most col <laughs> colorful, I'm actually the cold fish in the middle, as I keep saying, I'm the, the mm, filmmaker. Um, and, and that comes with this distinct tang, I guess. Um, so, um, so, 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 so this, I guess getting the film back was kind of my way, my excuse to kind of say hi to them. I mean, I, I, it sounds very facetious that that's my way of saying hi, but really it was. And it was like a way of reopening a conversation, which also meant reopening old wounds. Mm -hmm. um, and the film is also about, you know, the evolving friendships like of women over time, which is something that I find um, extremely compelling, but it's very rarely caught on film or TV in a realistic manner, where it's very prickly mm -hmm. and it's not pretty. Well, and I think your your use of the word old wounds, something that it's important to understand yeah. is that 
you it, it's about a moment of trauma in your life and I think it's such an interesting and complex way of of uh, approaching that idea of like how do you revisit trauma so there's the fact of you wanting to do that you know with the other people who were involved in this experience but also like to reevaluate your own relationship yeah. to, to to something that you in many ways couldn't change right could we just um, play that clip so then the people the, the two that haven't seen it maybe can yeah. understand it a little bit yes thanks thank you so, so we had a surprise treat of a um, back-to-back video <laughs> material to consider. So the first was actually the trailer for the film, and the second was a clip. Do you want to talk a little bit about the clip, and if it makes sense to you, connect it to that, I, that idea of sort of, you know, revisiting something that was extremely painful? Um, talk about it? Like what? So I think it would still help to have a little bit of a sense of what that pieces from because you didn't get a chance to set it up so whose voice are we hearing oh that's my and voice tapes. and mm -hmm. that's um oh and then the, the the tape was um george cardona who's the guy who you know most people who've seen the film would know that was the man who who took the footage away from us who had been our mentor and our teacher in film class and we we directed this he directed this film and and then he ran off with all the footage for 20 years mm -hmm. so he he would send me um you know taunting tapes in the, in the intervening years. Just so sick. <laughs> but you have to watch the movie, uh, the ones who haven't seen it. Um, well, you know, I know that in the film you talk a little bit about how you spent a long time trying to process um, this, the experience of like losing this footage and, and coming to terms with the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you thought you'd never see it or hear from it again. Yeah. Um, you, but you pushed f film away from you for a period yeah. of time, you wrote, you, you know, what, so what was it like after so many years of saying, I can't, I cannot imagine making a film again, trying to make a film again? When did you decide to make this one? I was always imagining making films. So that was the thing that I was, I was always imagining making films. I just maybe wasn't making them. So I was making them in different ways. I was making them in my head. I was writing scripts and I was writing a novel. And I was made, I was made, I made some short films as well. But, um, but it was, you know, it was it was a huge process of me making the interior, exterior, the the pro, just making this film was kind of finally bringing everything. Because the original Shirkers was me as a kid, like trying to explode what was inside myself, which is like I was just full of ideas. And the original Shirkers was me as an 18 year old, 19 year old writing the script and just stuffing everything I wanted into a screenplay. Um, and we shot the first draft, <laughs> and and all the people I cared about in the um, you know in Singapore in my life then were in the movie. You know whether it was my grandmother who played my grandmother, my baby cousin who played my baby cousin, and all my friends were somehow involved in this in this whole adventure. It was an adventure. Um, so when that was taken away, it was like a huge chunk of my life just kind of ripped the uh, uh, just that went into a black hole, and and I just didn't know, you know, how to retrieve that. And so finally, when the these 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 boxes were returned to me, the boxes of film, like there was 70 cans of 16 millimeter film that was returned to me, um, totaling 700 minutes with storyboards and pictures and everything connected to the making of the film was returned to me in seven boxes um, between 2011 and 2012 when I was already a grown up. This is like, you know, 20 years after we shot this film and I moved to LA, I was a different person, I was grown up, I thought. Um, and um, and it was this this kind of a ghost from the past coming back into my life, and I just didn't know what to do, and I just put it all in the corner, as you do for ghosts, you know, when you're trying to move on with the rest of everything, and not think about it um, for the longest time. It was, um, you know, maybe it was three years, and I would say that because it's a shocking time amount of time to let go, um, three years before I could open those boxes and look inside. Mm -hmm. Um, because it was so dark and so traumatic for me that I, I just didn't, I knew that once I kind of, you know, started, began kind of fighting with this stuff, I would, it would be a battle I would be drawn into that might last a long time and cost me a lot of money and maybe my, my psychological <laughs> well-being. Um, and so I, I knew that it was a huge commitment mm -hmm. and I, I, I knew that I had to be ready for it. So I spent three years getting ready to open those boxes and look in there. I mean, it was really, it was like a Pandora's box. I mean, all these things. Um, 
and and then I you know when I found the stuff it was um, the cans you know because George is a really strange man I mean his impulses was so maybe even foreign to himself mm -hmm. because he, he yeah oh. <laughs> um, someone's going somewhere um, and you're here you made yeah. it <laughs> and and um, so he he wrapped up each of the the rows of film and with black plastic garbage bags. Um, so each, every single row was kind of pristinely kept, even though he, he stole this mm -hmm. footage and was traveling around the world with him and um, wasn't going to do anything with him. There was a part of him that just wanted to keep it pristine. I don't know why. I mean, this seems mysterious still to me. Yeah. But so for my purposes, maybe he thought someday somebody was going to find this treasure. Um, and, you know, it was, it was actually kept in, it was a great puzzle just getting the film back. I mean, it was a, because most of people, you know, most of the people here have seen it. I can actually say that it, was it wasn't like they were all returned to me all at once. It was another set of puzzles mm. to solve, and they were kept in different places, and I had to retrieve all 70 cans and finally find them, and they were, you know, all together, put them all together again. Um, and, um, yeah. Oh, wow. I was rambling. No, not at all. I mean, yeah. it's a, that that's the thing. It's a complicated film. And and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, you know, the, a lot of the words you use and the way that the trailer is cut, you know, conveys the reality that it's like it's a little it's a thriller. It's a ghost. It's appropriate for Halloween. It feels like a ghost it's a movie. Halloween movie. Yeah. yeah, you're haunted by the ghost of this thing. Oh, my, you my don't know if it's also, dead or yeah. alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think it's strange that people talk about documentary as if that is in and of itself mm -hmm. um, a genre. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's just a no. mode of... It's how, you, it's, it's how you source the material you're using, yeah. but it can be any number of other things. Yeah. And yours is so... It, sh it shifts so much. Oh, you yeah. know, there's like this high school story. There's, mm -hmm. there's a nostalgia portion. There's like your history. Mm -hmm. There's the ghost story. There's the thriller. And how do you wrap your head around that um that was i guess a kind of a my attempt to kind of capture the cadences of a life i i think um and where you shift from you know different different rhythms you know like the rhythms of youth of when it opens the movie opens and it's just full of um you know me recapturing what it was like to be an 18 year old and being full of ideas all the time and yeah. i'd forgotten that when i was making this movie I, I was not that person in the beginning i had to really research myself to rediscover who i was and to recapture that and then um and then as you go along you you kind of grow up uh, as i was trying to convey that i was trying to grow up the move the, the, the rhythms of the movie changes and it becomes more of a mystery and i become a kind of a detective trying to solve this great mystery of my life um and you know, things shift. Um, and um, I think um, I don't know. I mean, I, people worried a little bit at first because it seems so different to take that kind of risky, um, that risk of like tone changes and mm -hmm. without any warning. But the thing is, I was very inspired. First of all, in the early days when I was making the original Shirkers by the French New Wave, and I still continue to love those movies because, you know, that in the French New Wave, it just felt so free to me because they never quite warn you when they're gonna shift from comedy to tragedy mm -hmm. and back again without any warning. And this is kind of a freedom that was very true to life to me. Um, and I just wanted to reflect the spirit of the original Shirkers with this this Shirkers, mm -hmm. this documentary as well, to kind of, you know, have that kind of, um, you know, to, to kind of have that kind of unexpected um, adventure of life mm -hmm. reflected in film. Well, and then also in terms of the look of it and playing yeah. with, you know, there's of course already the contrast between the footage from the original Shirkers film and what you film today and the contemporary stuff, but there's also a lot of kind of like a animated elements or ha handmade elements and, you know, it speaks to yeah. the character that you've set up, the character of you yeah. um, who's interested in sort of like scrapbooking and collage yeah. and um, putting together a lot of different kinds of elements. So could you talk about how you also wanted the look of the film to reflect that kind of um, chaos. But, yeah. yeah. Because it was supposed to be a kind of a reflection of the inside of my head. So I had to um, dig into what was the inside of my head in terms of the paper materials and the, the graphic materials I had in front of me. And um, I was, you know, for those who haven't seen the film, I was very much, when I was a teenager, I was, my background was like doing zines and making things out of, um, you know, collages out of scraps and, you know, and making videos and things. Um, and so 
to to kind of start off this film, I had to kind of recreate that person. Um, I guess the 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 zine maker, you know, and the energy of that. And um, what was useful in making of Shirkers was that we had very, you know, I became very accustomed to working with scraps and, find, and thinking of them as treasures mm -hmm. from the zine background. So I wasn't actually um, discouraged when when I was trying to make this film and there was very little footage of George. Um, George is kind of a, a figure that kind of haunts the entire film and he's sinister and very, very present. But really, when it comes down to it, we only had less than 30 seconds total mm -hmm. of him, footage ever in any format, photos, anything. Um, and there was very little footage of me and my friends as teenagers in 1982 because we didn't have, you know, video cameras and, um, I mean, you know, cell phones to get videos of ourselves. So there's very little, I was looking between the margins of the original 16 millimeter film to find my friends doing the slate, you know, the clapperboard and, I mean, all that kind of stuff and just like stealing little bits and pieces and then forming them into, a, into you know, helping us build char them, their characters as, as, as they were. So that was, um, yeah. That was what we had to do. Well, yeah, and I mean, I'm a really bad answer of questions. No, no, no. That was that um, was great. It's a, it's a it's a whole process, and I, yeah. I it, it's actually helpful because I was wondering if you could talk about that mm -hmm. writing process. Your vo voice guides us throughout the film, yeah. um, and did you write as you went and as yeah. you discovered those things? Like you said, that you, you know you found this moment where mm -hmm. you'd see Jasmine with the copper board, or you'd yeah. see you'd catch this glimpse of George, and you're looking at it through yeah. through these adult eyes now. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a, did you, how much did you shape in advance and how much did you shift as you went? Um, it was always shifting every step of the way. Um, the, the wonderful thing about technology nowadays is that you can, you know, record yourself at home on them stupid little mic that you buy for 99 bucks on Amazon, as I did in my garage, because I, I edited this film in my garage. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just, um, you hate the way you sound. You always hate the way you sound for the first 10 takes and then, and then you adjust, and then you adjust, and then you adjust. And I, I wrote, I guess, a very, very, very rough rudimentary narration as I went along for the first, you know, 10 minutes just to set the movie up. Um, hated everything. And I don't think a single thing of the first maybe 70 drafts ever remained. And it just, I was just always changing, mm -hmm. like line to line, word to word, right up to the very end. Um, so it kept morphing. And I guess the, the just the freedom of the fact that you can adapt so quickly and change um, modes so quickly and, and, and moods and tones so quickly, um, kind of, and maybe, maybe also because I hadn't been working in film for a while and suddenly being, um, you know, um, acquainted with like the whole range of, of the 21st century technology that was available to you now as a consumer at home. Um, I was like so freed by it that I just kept changing and it made me make more risky moves because you know that nothing's permanent. You can always reverse it, you know, as a filmmaker, you know that and you can just always rewrite and switch and, you know, play something backwards, forwards, slow, fast. And there was so much freedom, you know, that you feel as a filmmaker now that I think I'm, I might have taken more risks than most people who are more you know, accustomed to what was available and just I'm more taking it for granted. I was like, my God, we can do this. It's so fun. Well, especially as someone who had this film ripped from your hands and thought like, that's the only copy that will ever exist. It must have been such a different experience yeah. knowing like, I can't lose this. I backed it up twice. I, you know? I backed it up 10 times <laughs> and put put all my footage in um, different places in my house because I'm paranoid. <laughs> I, I don't I don't trust. I'm a pessimist. I well, put it in I different. I wonder why. <laughs> I put it in different places, yeah. and then um, I put and I sent some to New York for friends to keep in their house, and some to keep in their work. And then it was like you know, and in different parts of LA as well, in case of earthquake in one part of LA where I live, that somebody else in a you know fire free because I live near places that could catch fire. So I was like, that was also part of the process. My dealing with my paranoia about everything. <laughs> Well, who was working with you? Like, I know uh, this must have been an extremely challenging film for an editor, and I was wondering if you could talk about your collaboration on that process and kind of who else was in the room to help you um, do this constant shaping exercise. Yeah, so I, um, it was me for the longest time. I could never get anyone to kind of believe 
in this thing for a long time because when you talk about this project you sound like a crazy person like you have this footage and then you have some songs and you have you want to do some narration and yeah you have a bunch of interesting friends that you can talk to and interview but like how are you going to string this together no one could actually see it because no one had access to the inside of my head which is really hard to convey um so i worked on this you know uh nobody i i didn't have any money so i couldn't actually afford to hire somebody who is a professional responsible american uh, you know documentary editor who was, you know, I had them as friends. Um, and then I, I had, um, I tried to, to talk in that CD, who was a, a great cinematographer, um, I mean, an editor um, who, who worked on The Wolf Pack and, and um, one of us. Um, and, and I, um, she, she was just, she, she wanted to be my consultant, um, but she couldn't, you know, she couldn't work with me because she, she works in New York and her methods are different. I needed somebody who had maybe the patience and maybe the, you know, who, 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 who I could afford to, forced to sit next to me and edit this film with me. And so some, a good friend of mine suggests that, you know, why don't I not look for editors, but look for an assistant editor, somebody junior, somebody who I could afford and then have the patience to sit with me and grow and learn. And so I found this 27-year-old um, um, skateboarder named Lucas Seller, who in LA, he's self-made, self-taught, um, you know, from Chicago and no, cred no feature credits really. Um, but I talked to him and we looked at, you know, some of the footage and we played music and I knew that he um, he had the same sense of rhythm and he was young enough to remember what it was like, you know, as a skateboarder and a kind of a counterculture kind of kid and, and he had that, that same kind of, you know, rebellious spirit I had and he said he knew how to work After Effects, which is I thought was very important to me to just kind of make, After Effects is the program that makes things fly around the screen, like the graphics that you see. And um, he was one of the people that couldn't know how to work this stuff um, Whereas like a lot of the traditional editors don't and they, they usually send that fine graphics thing to the end of the process. Once you've actually done the responsible thing of story and structure and then you send all the the things, the fun stuff off to some expensive place uh, far away that was that's going to charge you way too much money to make something fly over something else on the screen or, you know, make something come alive like some animation but you know I thought why waste that money and why do that last do that first because I wanted to create the mood and the headspace of what it was like to be a teenager first so Lucas and I sat in my garage for um, uh, a long time and we listened to music and we, we, we basically created we started with montages and just like all these things that you should never do but in this film in making this film I had to do to just kind of get me back to that headspace I just needed to be brought there so we built a time machine I mean basically we uh, built the time machine with graphics moving graphics and music mm -hmm. um, I worked with a composer really early much earlier than most people do I worked with a composer starting like maybe um, you know eight months before the finish line or um, maybe even a year um, so that's a much longer time than most people do um, and then we built sound effects as well. Um, so Lucas and I worked in the, my garage for about seven and a half months, off and on, because I kept running out of money, and he kept having to take on little other projects. And then um, finally, at the end, um, for the final five weeks, when Lucas was completely spent and just couldn't go any farther, and also because he was a young man, there were sudden storylines that were not so comfortable for him, um, you know, like so, certain darker things that he thought would make me seem unlikable mm -hmm. but I just wanted to go there because I thought the film was less good if you don't go certain places mm -hmm. so I found a second editor who was um, more mature and female because I think women are much more honest with ourselves and we were, we're, we we can talk more honestly and we're harder on ourselves and we're darker people and um, more heartless to I mean uh, no, just a little bit more ruthless without you know with with ourselves and so you know she she let me she helped me <laughs> go there um, to, to those places and um, you know, where, where I admit to certain things or certain things are said and, you know, certain, certain, certain darker parts of the film, the more mature parts of the yeah. film uh, are brought to life with me um, working with, with uh, Kimberly Hassett, the second editor. So it was a huge collaboration, different people with different skill sets and we all kind of came, like, and it just all flowed along pretty nicely. Well, and you've talked about this duality in the mm. film a lot about, like, child grown up, which is something that, you know, you described also as um, a preoccupation even when you yeah. were young. The idea, the, the like Holden Caulfield idea that, um, you know, you'd rather, it's it's better to die. Like the, the purpose of the original Shirkers is almost to say like, preserve your youth and die rather yeah. than, you know, age and become this shell. Yeah. <laughs> and in your editing process, you had, it's like you had to address both sides with different people even. You had yeah. somebody like engage with that, that sort of like youthful, 
um, anything can happen feeling and then somebody who could who could look more realistically at things that were dark yeah. and hard yeah because as a filmmaker um, also because you know I was working with footage of myself which was really one of the hugest most difficult things about making this film was having to see myself and hear myself so I began like as a filmmaker I started to put on different hats and just see it as a character mm -hmm. like a person giving a terrible line reading or a terrible performance and then you edit around that um, and so it, it stopped becoming personal I just wanted to tell, tell the best story possible mm -hmm. um, and and that was this I guess the later part of the film but the first part of the film was me recapturing what it felt like to be right. to be young yeah well, and I, th I, I thought about that a lot. I think about this every time there's a, a uh, I, I see a personal documentary because mm. I've never done it and I don't think I could. It seems so painful. Yeah. And you talked about how hard it is to hear, hear your own voice, see yourself on screen, but you did both times, like yeah. with, in, with a span of many right. years in between. So yeah, the first time I didn't see myself, which is why I didn't want, one of the reasons why I didn't want to look in those boxes was I didn't want to see myself giving that horrible performance, um, you know, but um, but 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 then but then now having to do it, you kind of forced to do it because the you know this 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 thing is like a train that just you know is just just rushing towards something, and you're on it and you have to make sure you 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 do something about it, um, and you you know make sure that the tracks are there so it doesn't fall off the cliff, um, and 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 so you you do it, you force yourself to 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 just confront yourself, yeah. um, and one of the things that's really interesting about I guess um, watching this footage again and talking to my friends, circling back to what you mentioned earlier, me, Jasmine, and Sophie, the three characters who were involved in Trickers back then and are grown ups, grown ups now, is that we, we you know, watching it and I realized um, that we haven't really grown up. Like, mm -hmm. And also, I would include the fourth character, Ben Harrison, who is yeah. the guy who did the original soundtrack, who's also our friend. Um, and also had his work stolen, so we went, yeah. went through this experience yeah. with you. And, and we, you know, there's something about all of us that, that was really kind of brutalized by this experience, even though none of them may, may kind of vocalize it in that way. But it was just that we, none of us have children. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all like kind of, childish and we, we seem to be like teenagers suspended in amber we still fight over the same things in the same way um which is which is you know you can fight with the same things you might do it as grown up but we do it in the same way um and that's disturbing so 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 it was just you know and, and then ben like you know just seeing ben like just like oh my god ben you're just still 18 that's mm. or 19 and it's just you know, heartbreaking, and and hopefully with this thing, you know, they get part of their 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 use back, and we can all grow up together, maybe. Um, yeah. um, we have time for a few yeah. questions from the audience. So you mentioned in the documentary that you work some with writing. How does dealing with past in the form of in a visual form differ from just plain writing about it? Um. How's, oh wow, that's a yeah. great question. Yeah, because you talked about engaging with this story in some of your novels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't want to go back. You're spoiled. Um, you have music. You have sound. You have images. Um, it's like everything you dreamed. Um, it's um, you can bring it back so much more immediately, especially with the use of sound, because sound tends to go beyond like right past your frontal lobes and right to people's hearts or you know your own memory almost and um you have all those kind of tools on you with you um whereas in in writing when you're writing a novel you have to write every single f sentence um I almost cursed there I'm sorry um but but um but it's, it's a grown-up audience yes so. I know I, I was told to be grown up today um but it's it's so it's it's um it's that's that's the hugest difference is that it's you have different tools and um, they're much more immediate and you you just thrilled actually you're thrilled by how immediate they are and how they can affect people and how you can bring you know emotions to the fore much more easily than having to write every single word um, which is also wonderful but a different skill set. So um, I was just wondering what the process of making this movie this Shirkers was like for you in sort of healing from that, you know, traumatic event you went to when you were 18, and also like, how it helped you maybe regain a sense of identity, or uh, how, 
watching yourself when you were so young and so carefree um, made you like reminded you of a self that you may have forgotten about. Yeah. I mean that that was that reminding myself of that was part of the healing I think seeing the proof that we were once superheroes and we were no longer um kind of you know um gave us I mean gave me suddenly a sense of confidence in myself and then having to make this film do my old self justice almost that I had to rise the occasion and make this a you know, an interesting, um, rollicking, fun, um, you know, a film, and not and not and not some kind of boring thing. Um, so yeah, so so so, and in the process of making this film as well, like just having to engage with all the of the materials with, as I, I'll say again, like just all the accoutrements of the 21st century available to you in the in, in on your computers and the things you can do you get so excited um that you sort of i mean i, I guess i regain my confidence as a filmmaker uh, making this film and my voice as a filmmaker um and and you know just in using these and telling the story and taking myself through um the whole process of growing up in, in the course of this film so you know i made i edited this film over nine months so i always think of it as a birth but it's almost like a kind of a rebirth in a strange way i mean it's really corny but um like a kind of a, a growing up process um but that by the end i felt a lot like people were saying why are you so calm you know why aren't you like why aren't you making him more of a villain aren't you angry because people are like often vibrating with anger for me and taking on the anger so I don't have to feel it. And then, of course, Jasmine and Sophie are just filled with emotion and anger, and um, Ben, who just finally saw this film for the first time um, last week, I think, um, and he just had to step out in the middle and just like wept, and he just couldn't take it. Um, you know, because it was it was such a, a big, dark part of our lives, and, and they, they didn't have the benefit of processing it the way I did, I guess. Um, so I guess I, I had the unfair advantage of processing and making this film and processing the whole process. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I maybe grew up a little bit making it. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, while you're making this, did you, I guess, look into any like, films about films or like, personal essay films or just kind of completely keep that on the side and kind of go in your own direction? Yeah, I kept those aside. I just, I didn't, I didn't want to look at anything. I just didn't want to. I mean, I mean, maybe I, I looked at Sherman's March, but that's like not because I was making this, but just because I was thinking. I know, I just, at some point, I watched it. I'm curious about what motivated George to disappear with all those footages, and what motivated him to return. Um, you have to watch the film. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, spoilers, but I, you know, one never can really tell what motivates people to do the strange things that they do. We can only speculate, um, and I think that's part of why he's so interesting to me um, and continues to fascinate me and that I don't think of him as just a straight out, flat out, I don't dismiss him as a, a lousy villain or con man. I don't use the word con man because I think it's much more complicated than that, and we were much more um, aware than that. And just people who are conned. Um, yeah, you. Yes. Uh, yeah. I love the film. It, uh, it's now uh, it's now become a personal inspiration in a way because of the uh, the way you're looking at your entire uh, thing, your film, and yourself uh, with so much layered and intricate ways. Uh, my question was about uh, there are certain sections in the film where there are a lot of homages and tributes to other films. And uh, in a way, you look at those films uh, connecting with your personal experience. And I feel it takes a lot of uh, courage to look at uh, your own personal experience as a third person. So could you talk about that layer? Uh, did you uh, wrote it in the screenplay mm -hmm. itself or uh, you added it during editing? Yeah. Is it courage or is it cowardice? I mean, the thing is, like, I, um, it's, it's so easy to hide um, and and you you because it's such an exposing it looks like such an exposing thing to do but really it's also you're, you're kind of hiding behind um, you know the protection of film and just thinking of yourself as a character and using narrative to kind of deal with certain things that you maybe can't deal with in real life but um I, I, I um, what was it like to 
What is your question? Like, yeah, what was it like? I mean, to... What was it like, and what did, when did you come up with it, with that layer, particular layer? Oh. oh um... Do you mean the the personal aspect of the storytelling, or do you mean the the film montages that? Yeah, different tributes to other films. Oh, um, yeah, because uh, you know, like George was okay. So George was, as you know, like such a a strange composite figure. He was never really just one sta static man. His identity kept changing. He's a shapeshifter, and his and his persona seems to be formed by all his favorite movies. Like mm. not even um, heroic characters, okay. but his favorite characters. You know, like. So many of which I couldn't even mention in this film because there's just so many that are not like, for example, um, one of his heroes that he modeled himself after was the hero of um, Eric Roman's Claire's Knee, which is a movie in which a 40-ish man um, has the ambition of just touching the, a 16-year-old girl's knee. And that's nothing stranger than that, but that's awfully strange if that's all you want. Um, so, so that was George's hero, like he, that was one of his personal heroes. He carried himself a bit like Jean-Claude Briali, and he sort of saw himself in that mold. And you know, there's a whole, he's, he makes him, like he's made up of a lot of his favorite movie characters. And that fascinates me because they're not really heroic or you know, ideal characters. And why would you choose those? Um, so that, that, that was the way I could also make it, I don't know, less painful for me. If I could just kind of consider him, George, in that form through these, Various, but also like trying to figure out what what this man was like through all these fictional versions of himself. I guess um, it was just something I, I just thought would be interesting because you know thinking about it was like me kind of making my thought process um, exterior. And people act like that's a superficial thing to sort of a, a, in part of your assessment of someone comes from their references and mm -hmm. their heroes and their either pop culture heroes. But it's actually extremely telling. It's so I, I remember when you reveal that he claims to be uh, modeled or the yeah. the um, for a sex size and videotape. Yeah. And I was like, who would even want to say that? <laughs> like, it, I know. It, it's a really incredible moment that like yeah. conveys so much without you having to say anything more. Yeah, I know, it's so creepy and it's, it's funny. It's also so funny. <laughs> and that clip of him, I mean, that, when I see James F Spader do that, I just like laugh. But you know, the funny thing though, is like they did cross paths. Um, so Steven Soderbergh has, was aware of George. I mean, they, they had friends in common, obviously, um, in New Orleans and they did cross paths. So, you know, it's kind of murky. I'm sure he knew about George, but, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a murky, murky thing. And has your relationship to George changed? You said, you, you know, you're still fascinated by him, but you don't yeah. harbor this anger. And is that different now because you made this film? Um, I think so. I was like, you know, when I was, I was, I went through different phases. I was watching the footage and I was slightly angry again. Um, but then as you kind of process this whole thing, I was actually angry at Jasmine. I mean, I, was, I shouldn't say this is being recorded. Um, but, but like, I mean, she was like, you know, this is like the nice stuff that I used. I mean, the stuff that she calls me, uh, you know, this is, this is the good stuff. And she, you know, the, the things, misremembered facts and accusations, completely unwarranted. And, um, you know, I, I just, when I was watching that footage and transcribing it, because I did the transcriptions myself, I was like yelling at the screen every day. It was like a torment for a week. It was a two hour interview and it was just like so much stuff. Anyway, so that, that, that you know, it was reliving and re-engaging with these characters as if this was live. Um, um, but George, yeah, I, you know, I think I, I, making this film really helped me process my, my feelings and, and, and kind of kept it, I don't know, manageable because this could quickly escalate and become some kind of huge revenge. But, you know, I think it's, it's better to have a, 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 a happy triumph. Well, and you've touched on how opening up this, this was such a personal story and mm -hmm. something you held really close creatively, personally, and now you've opened it up to a lot of people. And we were talking a bit earlier about how it's not just, you know, because it's on Netflix that, that, that it's available all over the world. Yeah. And I know, you know, one of the things that I really appreciated about the film is that I'd seen independent films about like young outsiders or young sort of like cinephiles, but n 
I grew up in New Delhi, which is yeah. not oh, exactly wow. Singapore, but that sense of place you grew up that in New I, Delhi, really? Yeah. Wow, cool. Yeah, but that idea of like that something's reflecting a, a different strand of that experience, something I can relate to more. You know, do you find that reflected back to you from people around the world who yeah, are watching this? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from, from people all over the place. Like, just like, I'm a teenager in, in a small town in the UK. I want to make films now. I'm so inspired. And like all these people, and also having traveled with the, the film, um, you know, since Sundance to little festivals and big, bigger festivals and people in smaller places often feel really kind of appreciative of this, this, this film because it's, I was somebody from a nowhere place with no access to stuff and still we were kind of making stuff and it's just kind of reaches something in a lot of um, younger people, actually people, young people of all ages, like even older people who say that, you know, it's kind of one made me, because they feel like I'm talking to them. Because the, the horrible thing about doing a VO is like you're doing a VO, um, but you're also talking to people. And I didn't realize in making this film, writing the VO, that I am talking to people and people are hearing me like me talking to them. So it's kind of strangely personal and, and me talking to them and telling them my secrets. And then they often come up to me after screening and want to tell me the entire life stories. Um, that hasn't happened on Instagram, but because it's 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 hard to type your life story on a phone, <laughs> but um but but the, I keep hearing from from young people who just want to you know tell me that they they're completely inspired and, and different places in the world too, and that's great. That's a wonderful thing about Netflix. Yeah. Um. So I, I just have a question about as you were making it. I guess did you have an audience in mind, or did the platform you wanted to launch kind of like this on? <coughs> No, it's just really, really trying to make the best film possible and the most compelling version of the story possible. And I was, um, I guess, uh, confident enough to think that if it was good enough, it'll find an audience. Um, and no, I, I wasn't really thinking of the the platform. I was really not thinking of the platform. I mean, I was aware of the platforms and I was, you know, harbored far away wishes for some kind of platform, but no. It's just great that it, it landed somewhere that allowed you to speak to the people that you, you felt you grew up like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's accessible um, to people who aren't living you know, close to our house cinema and this might play for two days and what, five people show up or something and, and that's it, you know, and that's, I'm very cognizant of the realities of documentary film distribution or just, you know, art film or just independent film distribution and it's not an easy landscape and I was not going to deceive myself into thinking that this was going to be, you know, playing for weeks and you know, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. So, and, and it's hard to see and I just, you know, I, I'm, I still can't get over the fact that you grew up in New Delhi. Wow, okay. <laughs> well, we actually have to wrap up okay. because, um, do you want to, do you want to tell them where you're going uh, yeah, next? To, Maybe I'd uh, like to join you. No, I'm running downtown <laughs> to do some crazy thing, um, which is at the Metrograph, they're playing, and I think you're missing it because it's on now, the, um, they call her Cleopatra Wong that was shown, that that, that, that clip of which that was in, yeah. So that's shot in Singapore. Uh, partly shot in Singapore, <laughs> starring my, I, I didn't say that in my, the film either, she was my stepmom. Um, so what? clip, yeah, it's Mary. That's the thing I can't get over, but we don't have time to get into. It. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, and then, I'm gonna do the Q and A for that somehow, and then I'm gonna introduce this film, which is rarely seen, which is Lovers on the Bridge, The Lovers on the Bridge by Leo's Carrex, which is a film from 1991, and it's really hard to see, and it's a print has been flown over from Paris for the screening at the Metrograph, and I'm gonna say a few words in the beginning about how it saved my life after Shirkus. Yeah. Um, Thank you for, for <laughs> being here and tolerating me. <laughs>